Hello and welcome to our latest session in the Royal Television Society's Digital Convention 2020. I'm Kirsty Ward and I'm delighted to be joined by Gary Davy, the Chief Executive of Sky Studios. Uh, Gary, first of all, hello. And tell me, what are your guilty pleasures or not so guilty pleasures of uh, lockdown? The things that you're loving watching? Oh, that's a really tough question. There's a lot of great television around. I think my favourite show that we've made this year is um, a wonderful series with Billy Piper called uh, I Hate Susie, which has been a great success for us. Uh, guilty Pleasure from Netflix, dare I say it, that I'm enjoying at the moment, called The Queen's Gambit. Yeah, Brilliant. I'm mean, I mean, enjoying that. And of course, the one show that everybody's currently obsessed about is The Undoing from HBO. Glued to that. Glued and the thing is, that. when there's no instant gratification, you've just got to wait. Well, I know. Well, for years now, we've sort of been obsessed about the box set dump, you know, uh, and we're used to it. I mean, it's part of our culture now. But I have to say the, the weekly anticipation is actually quite intoxicating with that show. The genius of David E. Kelly. What a storyteller. Amazing. What a storyteller. Big little lies. Just oh, start to finish. Um, we're going to talk about your vision and strategy. But first of all, you've been in the industry for many a day and had all sorts of different roles. But I wonder now, are you in your perfect role now? I mean, you get to do all the hands-on creative stuff. You get to work with small companies. You get to work with, you get to have vision stuff, but you also get to be that small-time creative who looks at a script day in, day out. Yes, uh, I have to say this is my perfect job. Uh, not that it, not that I'm any good at it, but I should point out, but loving it. Um, so I feel like I'm, the, I'm the, the gamekeeper turned poacher, having been a broadcaster all my life, and now being a supplier. So now I know what it's like being a supplier and all of the demands that come with that. And making those difficult choices, is it's a very different world from the world of program scheduling and planning very different world, but I am loving it. Great people. It's a very exciting yeah. time, actually. Very but, uh, I couldn't have been a more challenging year to do it in though. Well, I think that's only only fair that you know you should have to hit this really hard and give it your best. You talked about um, I hate Susie, but what is working very well for you? What across the range is working very well for you just now? Well, I think we were determined to try to get across a broad range of program types and not get caught in any one particular profile. So I think that we've done well in, in, in comedy. So there's the normal 30 minute laugh out loud, high joke count comedies that John Montague does such a brilliant job of. But I think we really broke new ground with a series called Brassic, uh, which is a True, it's a it's a it's a sixty minute, uh, and it gives us time and space to explore a whole lot of other areas. So it's very funny, it's very authentic, very British, very northern, uh, and it's but beyond the comedy, it it's got a lot of heart and a lot of warmth, and it also deals with um, mental illness in a really clever, soft way. So. So we're doing interesting, brown, groundbreaking things in comedy. And in drama, um, really pleased with a big hit we've had with um, Gangs of London, which has been a big hit for us and working brilliantly internationally. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was so nice to find that enormous project because when we launched Sky Studios in the middle of 2019, we were basking in the glory of a a show called Chernobyl, uh, and it was going to always be a tough act to follow. <laughs> um, and it's still winning awards. But so yeah. I was really pleased that we found a momentum in, in drama. I think the Chernobyl experience is extraordinary, isn't it? Because it's a tough old subject, but it was so brilliantly done. And it's such a compelling story. But it also, I think, uh, proves the adage, don't look at your first figures. Oh, yeah. 
Well, I mean, Chernobyl was like a, the ultimate lesson in, in, in our craft in a way, because it wasn't a great idea. I mean, I remember trying to pitch the idea even to my bosses. It was like, you want to make a drama out of the Chernobyl nuclear disaster, really? Um, but having read the script, I mean, Craig Mason just created a masterpiece with that script. It was just superb. But then the script, you can't make a great TV show with a poor script, right? So that's the starting point. But there's this magic, and I'll st I still don't understand it, that last 25% that can only happen on the set. Yeah. Uh, and this is the, the genius of Jane Featherston, to bring those people together, the cast, the crew, the designers, the wardrobe, the, every little piece of it, the infinite number of things that can go wrong. So when it all coalesces, as it did on Chernobyl, that's how you create something really special. So I'll always be very proud of uh, I didn't make it, but I was part of the team that made it happen, yeah. uh, and I'm very proud of it. So, but it was magical to watch how it happened. In to your point about the overnights, perfect example of how irrelevant the overnights are, are becoming. I mean, it was in its overnight. I think it did like two hundred and sixty thousand viewers, and within seven days, it was in the millions. So it was just this explosion of word of mouth around the thing that just people just flopped into it. And it was a very exciting couple of weeks. So tell me, what is the vision for Sky Studios? If you were to sort of, in a nutshell, what's the, what is the driving force now for Sky Studios? Well, it's, it's actually a lot easier than it might seem because the, the whole vision is driven by our customers. And we've, we've always believed in this very simple principle. I, I've got a, a little old wooden stool in my office, three-legged stool, and on one leg is printed content, another leg is innovation, and another leg is service. And it sounds trite, but those three things are really unique to the DNA of Sky. So we identified very early on that our customers were loving big, ambitious drama and comedy. Uh, and by ambitious, I mean big in terms of scale, big in idea. Um, the byproduct of that, of course, is big budgets. <laughs> Can't avoid that. Uh, and and we could see the appetite for this content growing, growing. And even though a very big number of our customers also have Netflix and Amazon, of course, the BBC is still delivering fantastic drama. The appetite doesn't seem to be waning in any way, shape or form. So we've also thought that, you know, for the future, Sky, a company like Sky needs to make a bit of a declaration of independence from the traditional Hollywood studio suppliers mm -hmm. in terms of content, both in film and drama and comedy. So it was critical that we achieve a critical mass of high quality original content that was targeted at our customers. So we're not making our shows for the world market. If our shows reach the world market, that's sort of incidental to the core mission to serve the Sky customer base. Uh, so that makes our jobs a lot easier than it otherwise might be. Because we're, we've got, we're a supplier, Sky Studios is a supplier to one very big customer called Sky. Uh, and so far, that's what it's worked pretty well. It's interesting about the audience. I remember, you know, when this was all kicking off and it was like, oh, people will never be able to find their way between Amazon and Netflix and Peacock and Sky. But actually, viewers are incredibly discerning and they search and they search very quickly. You must have yes. data on how quickly people find your shows. Oh, yeah, we, we, have, we have an enormous amount of data, as you oh, can imagine. Yeah. Uh, but yes, and, and they, are, they become very sophisticated. You know, they can spot bullshit from a long way off um, and, and they can choose very effectively, particularly now with um, the sophistication of user interfaces. And as Sky increasingly becomes a sophisticated aggregator of content, 
So we happily have Netflix on our platform and we, we present Netflix shows in our user interfaces alongside BBC, ITV and Sky shows because we want, it's all about the customer experience, right? Yeah. And so Sky shows have to compete with the BBC shows, the ITV shows and the Netflix shows and the customer decides. Uh, it's the most incredibly powerful and dangerous democracy that God ever created. And it's brutal. Our customers will, will abandon shows quickly if they don't like them. Uh, so it really keeps us on our toes, both in what we're choosing to make, how we make them, and how we encourage customer engagement, how we keep customers through the episodic journey for as long as we possibly can. It's, it's a very interesting time to be making programs. Um, and I wonder if we can just talk a little bit about talent, because I wonder what your view is on this. Um, because, you know, Netflix sign Harry and Meghan, and then, uh, you know, we have Amazon uh, with um, Phoebe. Uh, and I wonder if that road is one that you've considered going down, and would you? Good question. We, we haven't uh, done any overall deals with on-camera talent at all to date. Uh, we have done some limited development deals with program makers, storytellers. Um, I think the idea of having a talent deal is dangerous because I think what matters first is the story. Uh, and then finding the right people, whether it's the writers, producers, directors, cinematographers, et cetera, et cetera, and on-camera talent to fit the story. I just worry about the idea of having a commitment to on-camera talent and then scrambling around trying to find a project to fit. That seems to be kind of ass backwards to me mm -hmm. um, and risky. We much prefer an organic approach to development where we start with a story outline. We spend an enormous amount of time getting scripts right. So working closely with great writer teams, then attaching directors and cinematographers and talent, on-camera talent. That seems to me, I mean, it might be an old fashioned approach, but I think that's the one that works best. Well, if you take that, um, an example of that approach, it would presumably be Lucy Preble. Lucy Preble is a, an extraordinarily talented writer. Um, and to team her up with Billy Piper was a perfect example, right? So Lucy had this extraordinary idea and a structure to that show where every episode had its own theme and explored that theme in quite excruciating detail at times. I described it as a, a masterclass in anxiety. That <laughs> but, 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 but Lucy had a vision for the show um, that just the, the match for, with Billy as the performer was perfect, right? But to have a deal with Billy that says, okay, let's go and find a project for Billy, it just doesn't make sense to me. No. Um, but that, um, that you know, Lucy Preble said that you know, Sky offered her a tremendous amount of freedom. So I wonder how you do, how, you know, you, you talk about needing to nurture talent, but how do you develop that relationship? And how do you find that new person that is the new Lucy Preble? We have to experiment and, and yeah. we have to take risks. Um, Look, Lucy's, Lucy Preble can take her work anywhere in the world she wants. So we were very proud to have Lucy working with us. Um, and I, Lucy will continue to work with us. Um, your question about the creative freedom, it's a really tricky balance sometimes. I, I think we, we get very picky in the, in the script, script development phase where we, you know, because our principle is if the script ain't right, the show won't work. So we spend a lot of time working with writers and producers on the scripts. But once you get on the set, once you get production, you have to have an enormous amount of trust in your director 
mm-hmm. uh, and the rest of the team because the last thing they need is people like me standing around the back of a set moaning. So I very rarely visit sets. I don't think it's constructive. Um, you talked at the beginning about how well I Hate Susie is doing in America, but you say that you make uh, content for territories, you're making original content for different territories. But in this world, what is a territory? You make it for that territory, but there's no knowing how it's going to move in another territory. And you find people finding things in the most extraordinary places and grabbing hold of them. You know, either they're, if it's first language English or need subtitles, and I'm thinking of things I've found that I, I love that are from different territories. And I wonder if things are doing very well for you unexpectedly in unusual territories. Yes, I think, I mean, even I Hate Susie, you, you, in the early stages, it, it, it looked like a very English piece, mm-hmm. right? But I think it, it, it dealt with the humanity so brilliantly, it's going to work anywhere. Um, so it's, it's very difficult to tell. Sometimes we get it right, sometimes we get it wrong. There are some very big pieces we've made in Europe that we're very proud of. In Germany, we've had great success with Das Boot. Uh, we're in the middle of shooting season three of Das Boot right now. Uh, Babylon Berlin, we've, we're getting ready for season three. I mean, they hit a quality threshold that I think is a world standard. And um, they're just well-told stories even though they're in German, but I think there's a following of that kind of content all over the world now. And that's really gratifying because the quality of the work is just not a question, it's just unquestioned. Same with the, the quality of the work coming out of Italy as well. Yeah. I mean, Italy, of course, has a fantastic filmmaking tradition yeah. with global audiences. Um, television, a little less so in recent years, but we've, we have a show called Gomorrah that is sold in like 115 countries around the world. Uh, and so, yeah, it's uh, it's hard to pick what is going to work internationally. Yeah, there is no but algorithm. The, 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 it's like the motivation is our core pay, pay TV subscribers. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you won't necessarily take on talent and give them big deals. But what you will do is invent, invest in production companies. And I wonder how adventurous you are to prepare to be in that because, you know, there's some maybe well-known people, but also you find small companies and bring them on. Tell me about investing in something like Bad Wolf, for example. Yeah, so Bad Wolf is a very really interesting, really interesting example. Um, we and Sky and HBO obviously both love Julie Gardner and Jane Tranter and the rest of the team down there in Wales. They're just really great storytellers. So we were nervous about them being on the open market. So we both took a very, very small equity piece with a very simple motivation. It's called proximity. Mm-hmm. We just want to stay close to them. Neither HBO nor Sky has the right to stop them from doing whatever they think makes sense. However, we have a proximity to to the Bad Wolf team that is really helpful for both of us. And I think HBO liked the idea that they're looking over Sky's shoulder and Sky's looking over HBO's shoulder. Meanwhile, we've made a couple of uh, minority investments in into other um, startup scripted production companies that we like very much. Victoria Fay's new company and Hilary Salmon's new company. We love them both, Lighthouse and Longboat. Uh, and again, it's a it's a small equity piece. We, we will not stop them making shows for customers of all kinds, but we just like the proximity. Do you require first look? Uh, in a very vague, soft way. We, we would never stop them well, it's it's very simple. We they are independent companies that need to make shows for everybody, um, and we want to encourage them to be successful. If, if there's a show that they have in development that we really love, 
then we've got an opportunity to jump in early. That's yeah. that's all we've got. We can't stop them. But we are you, want to. No, but are you still on the hunt? Not actively. No, I think there's a um, there's a limit to how many companies we want to be participating in. We like the shape of what we have right now. Look, I'd never say never, though, Kirsty. Never say never. I mean, it, we're, look, we're highly opportunistic. If, if an opportunity came along that we really liked, of course we would look at it. But we're not, as you say, in the hunt. No. Um, you talked about uh, a little bit about uh, uh, the whole infrastructure and what's going on here, but you've taken a very big punt uh, with Elstree. So what was the rationale for that? Yeah, that was a really big decision. We we uh, we couldn't have done it on our own, but uh, after the merger with um, Comcast uh, and having seen the scale of their needs, the combination of NBC, Universal Film and Sky Studios, the combination of those three entities was such that we were all starting to get a bit nervous about the... Uh, access to quality soundstage space and so it made sense for us to make a, a big bet on production facility so we have a site um, near the uh, of the old elstree in north london um, to give you an idea of the scale of it it's equivalent to 22 football pitches uh, and the work has just started we've got bulldozers on the site now and the ambition is to open 12 sound stages uh, in the early part of 2022. Um, and it's a really exciting project. That is going to be transformative for a number of reasons, not least presumably in terms of craftspeople, in terms of grips, in terms of makeup and so forth. Um, and you know that's presumably is one of the things, do we have enough capacity? No, I don't think we do. And I think, you know, 2020 has been a great and challenging experience for the entire freelance community um, and for, for people like us who employ them uh, in most, so many ways. We think that there's going to be a significant deficit in all of the crafts, all the way from painters, carpenters, electricians, grips, the whole gamut of crafts that we need uh, in a studio space. So we're going to be investing in full-time employment of people, plus investing in training uh, and making sure that we work with the greater industry to make sure that we've got a pipeline of young people coming through in all of the crafts. It's really important. So there you have, um, particularly talking about the, the drama that's been going on, but what about um, other uh, areas of Sky Studios? What else is in, in your thoughts? Um, well, I think we've, we've very recently taken a, a, a more aggressive position in documentaries. Um, and that partly because again, servicing our big customer Sky, Sky, uh, this year has launched, you know, four channels that uh, are highly reliant on documentary content, history, uh, documentaries, nature and crime. Um, now, there's a lot of acquisition going on, but also a lot of production. So we've gone more aggressively into high end uh, documentary storytelling, both one offs and doc series. I'm working on one personally with um, with Jim Sheridan uh, on a fantastically interesting story in Ireland about the brutal murder of Sophie de, de Plantier 24 years ago. So those kinds of intriguing, unresolved, fascinating mm -hmm. stories that um, are difficult to tell in an hour. Um, that we're, we're, we're telling that story with Jim over five hours and it's uh, it's been a fascinating project. So high-end docs is something. Yeah, 
that started in a way as a podcast, didn't it? And so that, that whole story about this murder and so forth. And you come along with a big stonking documentary series and practically the same week, Netflix comes along too. I mean, how extraordinary. Yes. Well, yes, that was kind of amusing. I mean, there've been quite a few people working on this in the background over the last few years. And we knew Netflix were working on a, on a project. Um, it was it was kind of amusing that they announced their documentary on the same day as ours, uh, but we're, we're just going to follow our own timeline, and uh, I'm confident that we've got. I've seen the the first episode, and it's it's brilliant. So you're looking for documentary. You're looking for more crime. You know that obviously fits crime, but actually crime in no, another. I mean, that one falls into the crime category, obviously, but um, no, we're working on sports docs and human stories, um, wide range of content types. Um, so the, as you know, the, the world of documentaries is like an infinite world, right? But that makes me think, although you're not looking to take a position in other companies, you know, if there was a big doc company or a fledgling doc company that you thought you could help with this kind of as it were, being in, in the vicinity, but not necessarily taking a lot of uh, equity in it. That would be something you'd be interested in doing. Yeah, sure. We're, we're talking to some doc companies about not necessarily taking equity, but having some kind of relationship where we can work together on, on multiple projects. Yeah. I mean, this is all about, as you say, the customer pays, but what you're also helping with is Sky Arts. It's not part of studios. But Sky Arts is actually free to air. Now that's how you know is that going to go on indefinitely? Yes, yes, it's a it's a, a really exciting thing that's happened. Um, I've always been a big fan of Sky Arts because, like documentaries, arts is you know you can define arts in any way you like, right? And it's in the eye of the beholder. So the scope for doing brilliant work in the arts category is just very exciting to me and uh, to take it free to air I think was a really bold thing for Sky to do. Um, uh, we had been debating it for a very long time. I was nervous about it um, but but clearly there's a place for it and because of the way we go about it we've got a very broad view of the definition of arts and it's a wonderful place to experiment. So. One of my favourite franchises was born in arts. I mean, we've got several fantastic franchises that just return and return. Portrait Artist of the Year, Landscape Artist of the Year, um, The South Bank Show. Uh, these shows just keep returning. But we launched an idea on Sky Arts called uh, Urban Myths. Um, and that's been a really hot bit, a fantastic hot bit of creativity because they're relatively short stories. It means that all kinds of people, writers, producers, talent can, can express themselves without making a, you know, six commitment to a, yeah. to a production. And out of that has been born some brilliant work. For example, we have a, um, an enormously important special on Sky One this year, uh, telling the story of Raoul Dahl and Beatrix Potter, uh, um, which started life as an urban myth. So the story is a six-year-old Raoul Dahl, who's obsessed about Beatrix Potter, uh, has had a terrible tragedy in the family. He's lost his sister and he's lost his father. His mother wants him to go to boarding school. So he decides to run away and leave Wales and go all the way to the Lakes District on his own to meet his hero, Beatrix Potter, who is a grumpy old thing. Uh, but it's just the most beautiful family, warm, uh, it's just brilliant. So that started life as an urban myth on Sky Arts and has found its way to this huge cinematic Christmas special on Sky One. So we love that. It's a great place to nurture not only ideas, but also nurture talent. So just coming right up to now as well, in terms of um, all our lives, um, when COVID hit, 
obviously every production, every, every broadcast, everybody was hit so badly. Um, what has changed for you in that period and what in a funny way have you learned? It's been an extraordinary journey. We we had in March we shut down 29 series productions. Um, now, as you can imagine, if you take 29 and multiply it by the hundreds of people who are typically attached to a series production, it's a, an enormous number of people and cost and logistics and safety and all of that. Um, I, it's been for me the most enlightening journey about the human spirit to see how people have work together not only across organi our organization and across productions but across the whole industry to just sort of dive in muck in and just make things happen safely taking care of one another it's just been a really moving experience we we got our first show back into production in june and now we're back into full flight now it, every day i brace myself for another positive test uh, and we're still getting positive tests but the safety protocols have become so sophisticated now that we can we can adapt really effectively so i don't think we're going to miss any of our delivery dates remarkably um, and that's a testament to the determination and the quality of the people that we employ in this industry so proud of it I think one of the things coming out of it, I think we'll start to think differently about what happens on set. I think there'll be a greater focus on production planning because I just don't think we can afford to mess about on set quite the way we once might have done. So, you know, showing up saying, okay, guys, what are we going to do today? Uh, I don't mean that as a criticism, it's just human nature that we it's that kind of environment. It's a creative environment. You have the capacity to do all kinds of interesting things. But with COVID, you sort of lose that luxury and you have to be planned. Uh, I think some of that planning culture will stick. There may be some negative byproducts of that because sometimes the true genius of production comes out of thinking of something or seeing something that you might not have done in a planning meeting, yeah. right? Yeah. So I think we'll behave a little differently, but, you know, not a lot. I mean, we'll be, be much more cognizant of safety generally, which is a good thing. Uh, and I think we'll have a, a rethink about the way we deal with our freelance community. Uh, that's important too. Uh, we've been working with the film and TV uh, charity to figure out how best to support that community. Um, so there is a financial issue to deal with, which is partly being supported by government and partly supported by an industry-wide charity. But the part that we need to now deal with is the, the mental health and well-being of those people. The issue that we're concerned about now and thinking about how best to deal with it is when you say to a young person, look, you need to go home now and self-isolate for 14 days because someone you were working with has had a positive test. What happens to them? You know, who's taking care of them? Uh, so I think that's still a gap that we, we've yet to address. But, but as an industry, we will do that. So, so that's where we are in the here and now with COVID and what you're planning for the future. And I think that's really interesting talking about supporting people uh, and their mental health. But moving forward now to actually what is next in terms of how studio is going to operate. You said right at the beginning that innovation is key. So what sort of things are you talking about? Uh, well, I think there's innovation in the, in the home and innovation in the studio. Um, and the two things might meet one day. Um, in the studio, I think, you know, we've been looking at what people lovingly call virtual production for a long time, which the, the simplest way to think of it is supercharged green screen, really. Um, but imagine a, a studio full of LED walls where 
the backgrounds are generated in a games engine uh, where you can have mobility inside a virtual world, which, which opens up almost an infinite creative opportunity for spatial creation. So you'd have your mid, in the middle of the shot, you'd have your props and part of the set and your cast. So the interesting thing about that is, you know, it's been evolving for a long time. I think it's been maturing. I think it's starting to get to the point where we will be using it as part of our L Street project. Um, because I think there are so many advantages in it, both creatively uh, and, and for safety reasons. It means that we can recreate a location without ever having to go there. Uh, and, and to be able to create very real interaction with locations. And then, of course, Sky being Sky, we're always innovating in the living room, um, developing our set-top boxes and the functionality. So obviously that's a journey that's going on as well. So it's a pretty exciting time on the technology side where I think we will ultimately find our way towards interactive content over the next five years that will be really quite exciting. We've had several false starts in that world, um, but I think I'm starting to see a world where that might work, partly because the creative content will start life wow. in a game engine. Uh, and therefore it's much more transportable for interactivity. Uh, so that's kind of exciting. And exciting way to finish, Gary. Thanks very much for such an illuminating conversation and to YouTube for sponsoring the RTS Digital Convention. We have a final session coming up later this month, so please look out for it. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you.